I got a top ten list of technologies necessary for a spacefaring society. Number one has to be reusable launch vehicles. That's the most conventional wisdom one. With reusable launch vehicles, particularly if they're doing repetitive payload, things like people, propellants, consumables, raw materials, where they're just shipping bulk cargo and people, I think that that's one of the real keys to getting the cost down low enough that anything else becomes realistic. It's not necessarily the first step that has to be taken, but we're not going to be a spacefaring society until we're actually, you know, flying reusable vehicles. I mean, there's just, it just doesn't make sense. Number two, orbital propellant transfer. Number three would be orbital propellant storage. If you want to go past low Earth orbit anywhere and you're using RLVs, RLVs aren't going to be the size of Saturn V. They're going to be small. In order to actually be affordable, they're probably going to be only in the two to 4,000 pounds payload range. You know, be able enough to fly a couple of people or some propellant or some consumables or something like that, but they're not going to be replacing EELVs or heavy lift launch vehicles. In order to go anywhere outside of low Earth orbit, you need to be able to transfer propellants. Going anywhere outside of low Earth orbit, and you're basically talking about a thin shell with a lot of liquid inside. And liquid is one of those things that's convenient to divide up into really, really small chunks, arbitrarily small, and happen to be a very ideal payload for reusable launch vehicles. Then the next two are in-situ resource utilization and arrow braking. Now, these, I think, make the economics for you know, inner solar system travel just become a lot more feasible. The economics just drastically change when you're not having to ship all of your fuel to land on the moon all the way from Earth. If you have a lunar vehicle that can refuel itself on the moon and you're only having to ship the actual payload or passengers, the amount that you can ship for a given amount of low Earth orbit payload just starts going up really fast. Aero braking is the other big technology. You know, you really want to have your in-space transportation stuff reusable also. Aero braking is one of those technologies that allows to greatly reduce the amount of delta V you have to spend to get anywhere. Going from low Earth orbit to lunar orbit and back to low Earth orbit propulsively is almost as painful as a single stage to orbit launch vehicle. With aero braking, you get it down to in the realm of like five kilometers per second, which isn't too much higher than some high performance suborbital reusable launch vehicles will probably have in the next couple of years. And you're basically cutting the problem almost in half. So those two make things more economically feasible. So those are all the transportation ones. So now the next five are more related to colonization. So number six would be orbital assembly. You can only take dry launch so far. <laughs> At some point, you're going to have to start docking things together. And that's just reality. Once you're talking about thousands of people living and working in space, they're not all going to be sent up in one or two huge modules launched on the world's biggest heavy lift launch vehicle. It's going to be assembled from much, much smaller pieces. Along that line is number seven, orbital construction. At some point, you're going to want to stop just thinking around with talking together tinker toy stations and actually building really big stations in orbit on the moon, Mars, asteroids, Venus, sky colonies, you know, what have you. In order to do that, you need to learn how to construct things in harsh environments, microgravity. We're talking shipping up raw materials, either from the moon or from the Earth's surface or from asteroids, processing them there in orbit, welding, doing all those sort of things that you see in the sci-fi movies. In most industrial stuff, they don't build a factory at another factory and ship it off. They send girders, they send cement trucks, they send, you know, what have you. Learning how to actually do construction on orbit, I think it's going to be really key before you actually start seeing large numbers of people in space. Number eight, closing the water loop. One of the single biggest life support costs is water. Sanitary water for showers and washing clothes and things like that, it adds up quite a bit. It ends up being over three quarters of the consumables is the water that they use. And closing that loop alone 
takes you most of the way towards having a closed loop life support. So actually, you know, why don't I call a closed loop life support systems? The better you can close that loop, the less it costs to live in space, and the less it costs to live in space, the easier it is to find economic justifications for doing so. Number nine, I think artificial spin gravity is going to be important. Living in microgravity just isn't going to cut it. Human bodies weren't made for it. There's an interesting question. How much gravity do humans need? We don't know, unfortunately. We only have data points at zero and one and nothing in between, or very little in between. So along with artificial gravity, learning how the human body reacts to partial gravity. We don't know if lunar gravity may be enough. Sixth of a G may be sufficient gravity to settle fluids in your body, prevent all the different muscle and bone decay problems, or it may take three-quarters of a G. It may be that Earth and Venus are the only places in the solar system that have enough gravity naturally for people to live there, or who knows. And we need to find out. We have no idea what the curve is between those two points, and that's important. And then just to be controversial, number 10, space nuclear power. Uh, I think that solar power can get you a lot of places, but especially once you start talking about going out past Earth orbit to asteroids, Mars, anywhere further, you really need nuclear at some point. And even on the moon, nuclear makes a lot of sense because the uh, lunar cycle, you have 14 days of sunlight, 14 days of night, and you really need some way of being able to provide power during the nighttime. Now, there's other options, but space nuclear power would be very useful. So anyway, there's my top ten list for technologies necessary for a spacefaring society.